Good evening and welcome to Mining the Riches of the Parsha. Tonight is Thursday night, March 14th, 2024. Of course, we're meeting tonight at 8 p.m. and we're going to continue at 8 p.m. through the rest of March and April, 8 p.m. on Thursday nights. On April 25th, which is in the middle of Passover, we're not going to meet. But the following week, right after Passover ends, March, uh, I'm sorry, May 2nd, we will resume at 7 p.m. So tonight and the next few weeks at 8 p.m. Thank you very much for joining. I've been looking forward to this all week, and I'm grateful to every one of you for giving your time to be able to study together tonight. There's a town in England outside of London called High Wycombe. And in this town of High Wycombe, every May since 1678, they have a public ceremony in the middle of the town square. In the middle of the town square, they set up large brass scales and the mayor and the other town officials are required to get on the scale and to have an official weigh them and compare their weight to last year. Now, this started in 1678 when this town had a mayor who was a drunk and the people wanted to get rid of him. And so they wanted to make sure that their town officials were behaving properly and being responsible. So when the official person weighed the, uh, the, the, the mayor, let's say, and compared it to last year's weight, so the person would, would yell out, and some more meaning if they weighed more this year than last year. And at least in former times, the people in the crowd would start throwing rotten tomatoes and eggs at the mayor. But if it went the other way, the person would call out and no more, meaning the person had lost weight since the year before. And then the crowd would cheer and they would applaud and they'd be very happy. Um, <laughs> I sadly must say that if I was forced on the scale, I would be receiving rotten tomatoes and eggs this year. Got to do something about that. But when I first learned about this in an article in the New York Times several years ago, I immediately thought about this week's Torah portion, the Parsha of Pekude. Now, two weeks ago in the Parsha, Kisisa, we read as follows. Moshe el Ohel, and it was when Moshe left his tent to go somewhere else. Yakumu Kolaam, all the people along the pathway would stand up out of respect for Moshe. Venitzfu Ish Pesach Ohelo, and each person would stand at attention at the doorway to their tent. Vihibitu achore Moshe, and they would watch Moshe pass by, Moshe Rabbeinu, the great Moshe, and they would stand out of respect and watch him pass by. Adbo Ola until he receded from view. All right, so it's like this pageantry treating Moshe like a king, the person that he deserved, the way that he deserved to be treated. A rabbis in the Medrash add the following. One time, it happened that Moshe was walking and all the people are lining the pathway and they're standing out of respect. But as Moshe's walking, he hears a couple of people murmuring in the crowd. Shama leitzane hadar. Shohayimasichin acharav. Moshe heard a couple of leitzim, a leitz, a leitz is a person who, when everybody is standing respectfully, they're the ones that make a joke. 
when um, there's a solemn moment, they're the ones to crack a smile. That's a let's. A let's is a person that just is cynical, that makes fun of everything. It's a let's. So Moshe heard late Sunday Hadar. There were a couple of these late sim, a couple of these good for nothings. But Moshe heard them speaking to each other as he was walking by. And one of them said, Hmm, Moshe, looks like he's put on a little weight this year. And the other one said, Well, with all the donations of gold and silver to build the Mishkan, certainly Moshe skimmed a little off the top, and he's been indulging a little bit in his newfound wealth. So the Medrash continues, Kishishama Moshe Kach, when Moshe heard this, I mean, imagine how you would feel if you were Moshe and you heard people gossiping like this as you walked by. When Moshe heard this, Amalei, he said to himself, Nigmar HaMishkan, Etein Lochem Cheshbon. As soon as we finish this project of building the Mishkan, the sanctuary that will travel with us through the desert and eventually will become the Beit HaMikdash, this grand project that we've been learning about over the last several weeks, as soon as this project is complete, I will make an accounting. And that's the reason for the beginning of our Torah portion, Ele Pekude HaMishkan, this is the accounting for the Mishkan, Mishkan Ho'edus, the Mishkan of testimony, Asher Pukad Alpi Moshe, the accounting, the audit was done at the direction of Moshe, Avodas Halavim, the work of the Levites, Biad Isomar ben Aaron Akohen, and the person in charge of the audit was Itamar, the son of Aharon. And that's what the beginning of our Torah portion consists of, this accounting. How many pieces of gold, how much silver, how much copper, down to the shekel, how much was received, and what it was used for, to the shekel, no waste whatsoever. So I want to share with you two very important lessons, practical lessons that we need to learn from this interchange. Number one, no matter how good you are, no matter how right you are, if you act in public, there will always be a let's somewhere in the background ready to criticize you. The one criticism that is literally ludicrous when leveled against Moshe is dishonesty because God himself says in the Torah, Moshe is the most trustworthy human being in the entire world. God himself says this. So to accuse Moshe of not being honest with the accounting is, is ludicrous. Of course, this does not mean that anyone who criticizes you is a let's. Could be it's to deserve criticism. And whenever you are criticized, even by a late's, you should consider, you should rethink. Maybe there's something to learn from what was said. Maybe there's something to correct. Of course, the criticism of a late is wrong. What those two people in the crowd did was wrong. It's an Avera, it's a sin to speak about Moshe like that. But here's the lesson we need to learn. Being right does not insulate you from being criticized by a late in a sarcastic manner. So you have to expect it. And you have to not get frustrated by it. It's simply a fact of life. I wish that I had learned this lesson 
at the beginning of my career about 40 years ago. I would have saved myself a lot of heartache. But it's just a fact of life. And there's a second point. And this point is made by Dr. Mayor Tamari. Pay attention to how Moshe does not respond. Moshe does not say, How dare you? I'm Moshe Rabbeinu. God himself said, Bechol Beisi Neman, I'm the most trustworthy of people. How dare you criticize me? That's not what Moshe says. Rather, Moshe ignores the motivation of the criticism and the tone of the criticism, and he responds to its substance. Ele pekude hamishkan. You have a right to a full accounting. I could have made a mistake, even Moshe Rabbeinu. I could have made a mistake. No one is so perfect that they don't have to worry. And therefore, here is the audit. I want to be completely transparent and show you exactly what was brought in and exactly what was used. The Medrash Tanchuma points out, notice, the Pusset does not say that the audit was Asher Pokad Moshe, that Moshe did the audit. Rather, Asher Pukad Alpi Moshe. The audit was done at Moshe's instruction, but by a third party. It was an outside audit. Moshe teaches us the importance of not just avoiding impropriety, but the importance of avoiding even the appearance of impropriety. And if that's true for Moshe, where after all God did say, Bukhal Basi Naman, how much more so for us? If you work on any public task, if I work on any public task, it's important that you act in order to engender the trust of others. And that means responding to even unfair criticism with subs a substantive response, with transparency, to make sure that you convey that you realize that you could make a mistake, I could make a mistake, and I have to disclose, and I have to be open, and I have to make sure that I'm providing impartial information to support my actions. And this is true in every position of leadership. It's true in the leadership of a business or a company. It's true in the leadership of a community, of a synagogue, of a school, an organization. It's certainly true in politics. And a public task, acting in public, also means among your family and among your friends. They, too, are entitled to transparency and an explanation of what you have done. Unfair criticism and accusations can cause much pain and damage. If you have suffered this personally, you have an idea how painful and damaging this can be, and it's so much more damaging and painful with social media. It's not possible to avoid it. It's a fact of human nature. No matter how good you are, no matter how right you are, it can happen. The only thing you can control is your response. And for that, Moshe is the best model. There's a theme, a motif, in the building of the Mishkan, which we've been studying all these weeks. It is a motif that is repeated nine different times, and it's contained in one word, the word miksha. Miksha means beaten or formed from one piece. So, for example, the menorah, the Torah tells us, was very... Complicated. There were seven branches, and each branch had, had petals and blossoms and cups. 
and uh, it was a very complicated um, uh, object, but it was not made by forming the individual pieces of gold and then welding them together to make one big thing. No, it was miksha. It was started with one large block of gold and it was beaten down by craftsmen to make it into the final form, miksha. The Torah tells us about the same thing about the kapores, the lid on top of the ark, on top of the arum. We discussed this last time. There was a flat lid on top of the ark, and from that lid rose two statues of keruvim, of cherubs, angels with wings outstretched, very intricate and complicated design. But it wasn't that each piece was made and then they were attached. It was one solid piece of gold that was beaten into the final form. Now, I'm not an expert in crafts. I don't know anything about making things out of metal. But I would assume, I could be wrong, but I assume that if you have a master craftsman who's making something, you would not be able to tell the difference in the finished piece, whether it was different pieces welded together or it started out from one block of gold. I also assume that there is no practical difference. It's not stronger because of that. Again, I could be wrong, but that's just the assumption that I make. Therefore, the purpose of the Torah commanding that these objects and repeating this so many times to form a motif of the Mishkan, that it be miksha of one piece it must have a symbolic meaning. We're supposed to learn some lesson from the curious way in which it was fabricated. And there are several suggestions among our sages. One is the idea of an object that is miksha, that's made of one piece, is meant to signify, to symbolize the uni unity of the Jewish people, but not only the unity of the Jewish people, but the commonality of all humanity, because all nations could offer sacrifices in the Mishkan and later the Beit HaMikdash. It was a place of prayer for every nation. And therefore, it was clearly symbolic. That is, the menorah, for example, was meant to symbolize the unity and brotherhood of the Jewish people and also of all humanity. Obviously, it's symbolic. It's not literal because no matter how close or unified we are, we remain distinct bodies. I mean, you're in your body and I'm in my body. But at different times in history, we are given new ways of seeing things new appreciation of something we've always known and studied, but now we can understand it in a different way than we ever have before. So I want to tell you about an amazing achievement in recent years. You may know about this. The idea, the practice of a kidney transplant chain. Now, to date, the largest one involved 101 donors, 101 recipients of a kidney transplant chain. So let me explain. According to Jewish law, if a person is considering donating a heart or a lung, according to Jewish law, there is one central question, and that is, is brain stem death considered the correct definition for death. My opinion is yes, I'm in favor of uh, organ donation. That's a separate topic. But now you can or donate organs while you're still alive. For example, a kidney. You have two. You only need one. So according to Jewish law, there's really only one central question. 
should I or can I put myself at risk to save someone else's life? It's a balance of risk-benefit. So, first it depends on the level of risk. Today, donating a kidney is considered a relatively safe procedure. Obviously, each person has to be evaluated independently, privately. But it's done in a laparoscopic surgery. There is usually very little risk for a healthy person. And the current medical evidence is that for most people, living with one kidney does not increase any future risk. Now, part of that is because the criteria to donate a kidney are very, very strict. A number of years ago, I wanted to donate a kidney, and unfortunately, I was not accepted. I did not meet the health standards that were necessary. So there's a very rigorous testing to make sure that there's as little risk as possible. But for the patient with kidney failure, a person with kidney failure, that is fatal within weeks unless a person goes on dialysis. Dialysis means you're hooked up to a machine for four hours, three times a week, of those people who go on dialysis, only 50% survive more than three years. Unless they get a kidney transplant from a live donor, then 60% are still functioning after 10 years. So there is, again, for a healthy person that meets all the criteria, relatively little risk and relatively large benefit. And so... If it's ever possible for you to be able to donate a kidney, I encourage you to do it. It's a tremendous mitzvah. And the need is very great. The latest figures I have are from Canada in 2022. In 2022, there were 1,795 kidney transplants. But there are 2,813 people waiting for a transplant. And there were 117 deaths of people while they were waiting for a transplant. Of course, in the United States, the numbers are much higher. There are more than 100,000 people who need a kidney. Only 17,000 receive one each year. Every day in the United States, 12 People die waiting for a kidney transplant. Now, a large part of the difficulty is that there must be a very close match between the donor and the recipient. Otherwise, the kidney might be rejected. So often, a patient has someone close to them a relative or close friend who's willing to donate a kidney, but they're not a match. That's usually the situation. So a kidney transplant chain works like this. Take a person who wants to donate a kidney, for example, to a relative or to a friend, but they can't because they are incompatible with the recipient. Find someone else who can receive their kidney, who also has someone willing to donate a kidney who, who they are incompatible with. So in other words, you donate a kidney to a stranger and another stranger donates a kidney to your family or friend. It is a massive effort. As I mentioned, the largest chain so far is 101. 101 donors, 101 recipients, 101 lives saved. Now, it is a massive, momentous undertaking. Every step has to work flawlessly. 
It is an amazing feat of technology, skill, logistics. What does it take for a person to be willing to do such a thing, to donate a kidney to save someone else's life? One donor put it this way, you think of the pain someone is in and imagine you can take it from them and give them back good. It's amazing. It's inspiring. Another way to explain it is miksha. To understand that we are really connected as one piece, not separate pieces stuck together. To selflessly make you and another person actually one piece, not symbolically, not metaphorically, but literally, I become comprised of me and you in one body. And that is a poignant symbol for how we should try to feel about each other and act towards each other under all circumstances. Rabbi Samson Rafael Hirsch asks, why do we have two challahs on Shabbos? Friday night at the Shabbos meal, we have two challahs. Shabbos morning, we have two challahs. Why two challahs? Says Rav Hirsch, one for me and one to share with others. I have to always be ready. Even if I'm alone, I need to always be ready to share what I have with others. So I'll ask a question. Why did God create us with two kidneys when we only need one? One for me and one to share with someone else. Who needs it? That's the meaning of miksha, made from one piece. And this is true for us here specifically now. We're going through this horrible period where we are disgusted and horrified by the brutality of Hamas, the fate of our hostages, the pain and difficulty and grief of all Israelis, of Jews around the world. But what can we do from so far away? Well, We've discussed this many times. There are many things that we can do. But one, very important, is just the feeling of miksha, our connectedness. I shared with some of you before the comment of Rachel Goldberg Polin, the mother of Hirsch Goldberg Polin, who's being held as a hostage in Gaza, and his family has not heard any word from him since October 7th. And Rachel said, it will take a molecule of the weight that I am carrying off of me, knowing that you are carrying it as well. Miksha, that sense that we are connected, and my caring somehow helps you deal with the burden that you are carrying. Rabbi Moshe Tarragon is a respected rabbi and teacher living in Israel. And he recently wrote as follows, Unity is a word that hasn't left Jewish lips or Jewish hearts in, in months. In response to a vicious and violent attack on our people, our entire nation rallied as one, independent of political, religious, or ethnic differences. Our common struggle for survival dwarfed every petty difference with which in the past divided us. This outburst of unity extended well beyond Israel's borders. Jews across the world partnered in this historical trouble, in, in this historical struggle. And this, of course, is true for all of us. They cried with us and lost sleep as we did. During the first few months of the war, we all experienced the tragedy in the exact same manner. Shock, grief, pain, darkness, and horror. On that infamous morning, Jewish hearts across the world 
broke in unison. And then he said, I am awestruck by how deeply non-Israelis, this is you and me, are emotionally invested in our common tragedy. Their sleep as ours is nightly disturbed. Yes, it is. Every community recites psalms, collects funds, conducts Torah study programs, sends duffel bags, arranges missions, amid countless other acts of support. Like us, they live with constant anxiety and uneasiness. Yes, yes, we do. We live with constant anxiety and uneasiness. And he writes, I am overwhelmed by how much guilt non-Israelis feel. And I just... I feel like he's just reaching into my heart, listening to what's going on inside me because I feel this tremendous guilt being here in Montreal at this time. Guilt at not being able to live in Israel. Guilt at not being able to do more from afar. That feeling of guilt is inside of me. Perhaps it's inside of you, but it's certainly inside of me every single day. But listen carefully. Reaching across the miles... I say to every Jew who lives outside of Israel but yearns to be with us and yearns to cry with us, we know, we feel your support and please don't ever stop showing it. We are you and you are us. That is Miksha. One piece from one block of solid gold. (coughs) There was one object in the Mishkan mentioned in our Torah portion which I feel doesn't get the attention it deserves. On the surface, it is a purely utilitarian object, not nearly as flashy as many of the other objects, but its role is absolutely essential and the lessons it teaches us are deep and necessary And I refer to the paroches, the curtain, the tapestry of many colors, which hung inside the Mishkan, inside the building itself, in front of the Kodesh HaKadoshim. So behind that curtain was the Kodesh HaKadoshim, the Holy of Holies. Inside the Kodesh HaKadoshim was the Aron, the Ark, which contained the Luchos, the two tablets of stone on which were engraved the Ten Commandments. We use this word parochas today to refer to the curtain in the synagogue in front of the Aaron Kodesh, the Holy Ark, behind which are our Torah scrolls. But the parochas was much more than a curtain in front of an opening. The parochas defined the Kodesh HaKadosh and the Holy of Holies from the lesser holiness of the outer part of the building. Putting the parochas in place, hanging this tapestry, created the space behind it with a higher level of holiness by placing a boundary between holy and the holy of holies. Kodesh and Kodesh HaKadoshim, the holy of holies. And first of all, that's a crucial spiritual lesson. Sanctity and holiness requires boundaries. Only when there there are things we cannot do and places we cannot go do we then create holiness where we are. We see this in the most comprehensive mitzvah that we'll learn about later in the Torah. Kedoshim to you, be holy. What does it mean, be holy? Says Rashi famously, 
rest- withhold yourself from certain actions. Pull yourself back. Shekol makam shatamotze geder, atamotze kedusha. Anytime you find a boundary, here's what you can do, but there is what you cannot do. That's where there's holiness. When you stay within the boundary of what you're supposed to do and where you're supposed to be. Conversely, living without boundaries, living without limits, doing whatever, going wherever you want, that leads to pure hedonism and materialism. To borrow from the poet Robert Frost, living such a life is like playing tennis without a net. You may have fun, but you will never become a good player. Similarly, we use the word kidushin, which means holiness or sanctification, as our word for marriage. By a couple agreeing to prohibit themselves from any other intimate relationship, they create intimacy uniquely between themselves. And this drawing of a boundary that includes the two of them and excludes everyone else, that creates kiddushin, sanctification, holiness between them. That is the essence of a spiritual approach to life. And the truth is, this is hard for many of us. You know, when Shabbos begins, we say the prayer Kiddush, which means the sanctification. We're sanctifying the day of Shabbos is holy. When it ends, we say Havdalah, which makes a separation, a distinction between the holiness of Shabbos and the mundane of the work week. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel once famously said, The problem for the modern Jew is they are able to recite Kiddush, but unable to make Havdalah. We try to act in a way that is holy, but we find ourselves unable to draw those boundaries about where we should not go and what we should not do. And without Havdalah, without boundaries or distinctions, the Kiddush, the sanctification, loses much of its energy. That's the first lesson to learn from the parochas. But allow me to finish with a second insight. And I'll start with an unforgettable metaphor used by the Rav, Rabbi Yosef Soloveitchik, of blessed memory. And he used this metaphor to help us make sense of our often incoherent, chaotic lives. Imagine you're looking at the back of a magnificent, unlined tapestry hanging in a museum. So if you look at the back, you see a profusion of threads strung wildly in every direction, a riot of colors with no apparent purposeful arrangement, No fine embroidery, only stitching, an appalling mess. But then you realize that you're only looking at the underside, the backside of a brilliant work of art. And after staring at it, the back, the the chaotic threads going in every direction, after staring at it, the picture begins to fall into place. You begin to detect a motif a hint of a grand design, a trace of a pattern, a fragment of a human figure. Now you sense hints of the tapestry's coherence and harmony. You know that if you could see its front side, you would find it breathtakingly beautiful. The Rav continues. From the earth, we contemplate God's universe from its reverse side, as it were. If we believe God is the divine designer, we will discover a coherent meaning from the clues we find, a grand design in the seemingly wild threads and colors of this world, because we're only looking at the back, not the front. 
Though we will never get to see it from God's perspective, we intuit that it is magnificent. We may be confused about the patterns of life, and on the surface it often makes no sense, but we feel certain that behind it all, beyond the reach of our senses, there is justice and fairness. Now, with this magnificent metaphor, we can appreciate the deeper significance of the parochas in the Mishkan. Rashi tells us that this tapestry had a beautiful image that astounded and delighted everyone who saw it. But unlike every other tapestry, the back of which is chaotic and meaningless, this tapestry was woven so that there was a beautiful image visible on the reverse side as well as the front. Now this is an outstanding act of craftsmanship. Ask any quilter or tapestry artist if they could even imagine such an accomplishment. But building on Rabbi Soloveitchik's metaphor, we see that in the Mishkan, in God's presence, Everything is clear. We see both sides. The world and our lives make sense as we see God's hand at every moment. Unlike now, when God is hidden and we only see the chaotic back of the tapestry. We're trying but we often fail to see any of the spectacular beauty and order that we know is on the front side. This Shabbos brings to a close our review of the Mishkan, later became the Beit HaMikdash, the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. In all of its details over the course of five Torah portions, five weeks, we will be studying this, and it comes to a close this Shabbos. For the last several weeks, we have been sharing many lessons about the meaning of this enterprise, this creation, the meaning that it has in our lives today. But the final lesson must be that this structure, this Ohel Moed, this place we encounter God, this is the place where God is manifest. It's the place where the world is clear and ordered and makes sense. The place where there is unity and purpose and meaning. We do not have it now. And we pray for its return. We pray to God, please, in compassion, return to your city, Jerusalem. And allow us the opportunity to see the ultimate, final, complete return to Zion. Until then, we only see the messy backside. We try to have faith in the beauty of the front, but it's a challenging task, especially today. We learn about the Mishkan and the parochas in particular to remind ourselves of what we are missing and what we hope soon to regain. Yehi may it be your will, God. She'yibane beis amigdash b'mheira b'yameinu, that the Beit HaMikdash in Jerusalem will be rebuilt speedily in our days. And that clarity, and that beauty, and that order, and that unity will once again become manifest. My friends, I wish you a good evening and a beautiful Shabbos. And I look forward to seeing you soon in person.